Zach Garnett, Jimbo Fisher fired from their respective schools. It's not every day that you watch a football game and days after it happens, both coaches get fired. The one that put up 51 points in a win and the one that only scored 10 in a loss. But that's what happened. And the SEC West coaching carousel has been turned on and around and around it goes. So let's start with Zach Arnett. He was in his first season at Mississippi State. And to me, this is a head shaker and a head scratcher because how can you fire a coach who is in his first season taking over for a legend in Mike Leach, rest his soul, and just, in my opinion, has not been given enough time to build a program. How can you build a program in one year? Do you understand how much goes into building a college football program? You got to recruit. You got to win games. You got to earn the trust of the, you know, the board and the athletic director and kind of get your feet under you too. Listen, Zach Arnett was a defensive coordinator for Mississippi State, obviously, but even um, at a lower level, ranked school in terms of the power five and the group of five as as soon as two years ago like my alma mater Syracuse was looking at him to be the D coordinator not the head coach and I think that he got this position maybe a little prematurely because when Leach passed away they inserted Arnett as the interim head coach and then he did a good enough job leading that team to a bowl win that they just made him the full-time coach bit of a gamble he's a great defensive mind but he's young and he hadn't had a head coaching job before even at the high school level, as far as I know, but definitely not the college level. He's just been a defensive coordinator, and that's a big step up going from a DC to an HC. So I think that that was a little bit of an interesting move to put him as the head coach. What's even more interesting is firing the same guy 10 games into his head coaching career as a full-time coach. I don't get it. Four and six, one and six in uh, SEC play, and only one of those six losses in conference action was by one possession. So, look, it wasn't a good team this year. We saw Mississippi State play in Starkville. They got boat raced by LSU. Really didn't compete with anybody in the league. They did beat Arkansas, which is good. So they weren't a good team. And, you know, I'm not going to try to explain to you that they were or make technicality, whatever. They weren't good. I get that. But when you rebuild a program, you got to bottom out. And that's what they were doing. They were bottoming out. You can't just skip the bottoming out process, fire somebody, blame it on him, because you know what? You're starting the process all over again. What's Mississippi State going to do next year? The same thing they did this year. Not be a good team. Unless some miracle happens and Georgia turns into Mississippi State, MSU is not going to make a bowl game next year. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. They're losing Will Rogers, one of the best passers in SEC history. How is it going to get better? I, I don't So. I didn't understand that move. Arnett tried to change the offensive philosophy from the air raid that Mike Leach had to the pro style. And Will Rogers, as I said, one of the best quarterbacks in league history, passes the ball very well. He belongs in an air raid system. I don't know why he didn't transfer personally. So the offense didn't work. It didn't fit the skill, the personnel that you had on your team. That's why this team wasn't good. Defense wasn't great either. It's Mississippi State. I mean, they're kind of like the Rutgers of the Big Ten. Like, they're solid, they're fine, they're never going to be elite. You're going to get out-recruited every year. You don't have the same resources that Georgia, LSU, Alabama have. It just, you got to be a developmental program. And you got to hope to win eight, nine games a year. So, I didn't understand that firing at all, to be honest with you. You can't pull the plug on a coach, especially at a program like that, after one year. I mean, that's a little ridiculous to me. But it's not money, my money I'm spending. It's not my buyout I'm paying. So just personally, I don't think it was a good move. That's just my two cents. So his buyout was low, Arnett's. On the complete flip side, and then some, Jimbo Fisher's was not. This guy's getting over $76 million not to coach at Texas A&M. Unreal. This guy's going to make what? I got it written down here. $19 million for the next 60 days. And then, for every year until 2031, Jimbo Fisher's getting a $7 million paycheck from Texas Stam to do nothing. He could sit in his room the whole day, and he's making $7 million a year. Unbelievable. And you know what? A&M just, they drank the Kool-Aid. Jimbo Fisher had one good year with the Aggies. It was in the COVID season. When they went 9-1, won the Orange Bowl, 
And then that's when he got that fat extension because people thought maybe he'd come coach at LSU because Coach O was out the door, right? And they drank the Kool-Aid. Think of that COVID year. It was such a wacky season. Indiana from the Big Ten actually looked like a good football team. Michigan went 2-4. and four. We all know that was an outlier. Just a weird year in college football. And I think that is when people thought Jimbo would turn it around there and they would just roll from that point on. But it never happened. Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M was an 8-4 and four season every year, it seems like. So that one I understand a little bit more. You brought this guy in to win a national championship. He won one at Florida State. At A&M, you've got a multitude of resources. He had top five recruiting classes every year. I don't know how, but he did. And all they could manage to do was win like seven, eight games a year. Doing less with more than other people do with less. So why should he be making that much money, like $10 million a year? I get that. The program was, quote, stuck in neutral, sources say. And, you know, he could make the excuse like he kind of does every year. I don't know what it is with A&M and Jimbo, but he never had a backup quarterback because every single year his quarterback got injured, and that would be his excuse. Hey, just wait till next year. We'll get our quarterback back from injury. And we'll be a good team. Every single year. You know what? That's what he would have said this offseason too. Because their quarterback went down with injury. And they couldn't do anything. They're going to be 8-4 and four again at best. So that one I get. You bring in all this talent. And you can only win 8 games in a season. That's just... That can't happen. You, you had the number one recruiting class last year. What are you going to do with it? I mean, with that, you should win the SEC West. They haven't won the SEC West since joining the SEC in 2012. And that was 11 years ago. So I more, under, I more so understand letting go of Jimbo Fisher. I think that there's maybe an argument on the side of keeping him, not only the buyout, but also, yeah, I mean, they have had a lot of injury problems and some bad luck there. And they've beaten Alabama a few times. And they've competed against some of the best teams. But at the end of the day, look, Jim... Jimbo, you had over six seasons, and all you could manage was 45 and 25 and barely scraping above 500 in SEC competition. And that is very underwhelming. It's very disappointing, and that's not the standard at Texas A&M, especially with the amount of money you make. So that one I understand. Zach Garnett, Jimbo Fisher fired. Two more positions open up in the SEC West. If you've got ideas on who fills those positions, drop them in the comments section below and let me know your thoughts on those decisions. For me, Arnett was a bad decision. Jimbo, I'm not saying it was a good decision, but more of an understandable.